I'd like to ask you to open with your Bibles with me this morning to Psalm 1. <clears throat> Psalm 1 this morning. It is truly an honor and a delight to be part of this conference. It seems as more and more churches are reforming, particularly more and more Baptist churches are reforming, the final area, the last area that sees any reformation is typically this issue of worship. Uh, they might be reforming soteriologically and in ecclesiology and so many other issues, but worship seems to always be the last area of reform. And so I'm very thankful for this conference. I'm thankful for uh, Pastor Waldron's new book, and I trust that these will be great aids in helping churches reform every aspect of their church to the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, not the least of which how we worship, not just the object of our worship, not just the content of our worship, but also how we worship ought to be conformed to the authoritative and sufficient Word of God. And I firmly believe that one of the key means by which churches can become more in conformity to the Word of God with their worship is by recovering a robust uh, influence from the Psalms in our worship, to recover a, a deliberate, intentional recovery of the Psalms in our corporate worship today. But of course, it's no secret that among most evangelicals today, the Psalms are mostly ignored in corporate worship. Perhaps a line or two will be cited as a transition between songs. Maybe a contemporary song will take a phrase from the Psalms and repeat it over and over and over and over and over again, but not much more. This despite the fact that the Bible is one of the longest books in our Bibles. This despite the fact that the Psalter is one of the most quoted books of the Bible. This despite the fact that the Psalter is the only book whose contents, as we read a moment ago, are singled out by Paul for us to minister to one another in corporate worship. This despite the fact that the Psalter is just as inspired, just as authoritative, and just as profitable as any other part of Holy Scripture. Our Lord himself said in John 24, 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. They're setting the Psalter right alongside the law and the prophets in terms of significance and authority for believers. C.H. Spurgeon was not wrong when he once bemoaned, even in his day, it is to be feared that the Psalms are by no means so prized as in earlier ages of the church. And if that was true in his day, it's even worse of a condition in our own day. Well, one of the reasons that I believe there is a contemporary neglect of the Psalter may be that most Christians today do not understand this God-inspired collection of songs. And this is perhaps most evidenced by the fact that even if Christians today do use the Psalms, perhaps in corporate worship or for individual purposes, they tend to exclusively gravitate towards Psalms of comfort, Psalm 23 is the most likely, or Psalms of praise. In fact, I would suggest that if you ask the average Christian today what the dominant theme of the Psalter is, most would likely say that the dominant theme of the Psalms is praise. And it is certainly true that the book of Psalms in Hebrew, Tehillim, means praises. We expect to find an emphasis on praise in this book. We expect to find expressions of praise like hallelujah, praise the Lord, in the Psalms. However, when we give just a little bit of attention to the actual contents of this collection, it becomes apparent that the book of Psalms was called praises, not actually because the book is just a collection of expressions of praise. In fact, while there are mentions of praise and commitments to praise the Lord throughout the Psalter, the key word, hallelujah, praise the Lord, does not appear in the entire collection until Psalm 104. 
The last 50 psalms, of course, are filled with expressions of hallelujah, but not until Psalm 104. Much of the Psalter is not actually praise. And so the question is, why then would a whole book be called praises if many of the psalms are not praises and you don't even find a real emphasis on praise until the very end of the psalms? Well, we have to remember, first of all, what we have here in the book of Psalms. Each psalm is an individual song written by various different authors like David and Moses and Solomon and Asaph and a few others. But contrary to what I think a lot of modern Christians assume, this is not just a loosely connected collection of songs. Someone didn't just decide to collect as many songs as they could together and just sort of loosely, randomly gather them. Someone did collect these songs and group them together, probably during or after the Babylonian exile, maybe someone like Ezra or a group of scribes. And these editors then arranged the psalms intentionally into five books in a particular order for a particular purpose. Now, there are, all, there are all sorts of clues that indicate this kind of deliberate ordering that I'm not going to get into this morning. But suffice it to say that while it's not necessarily, not necessarily clear how every single psalm fits into that order, it is clear that there is a deliberate ordering and the basic underlying purpose beneath that order is clear. One of the clearest evidences of this order and its purpose that we're going to look at this morning is one that I've already alluded to, and that is the fact that the emphasis on praise does not appear until the very end of the book of praises. In fact, the book actually starts pretty dark, and there are occasional glimpses of light through much of the first hundred psalms, but a lot of the focus is on lament. A lot of the focus is quite dark. For example, Look with me just briefly at the opening words of Psalm 3. I'm going to to emphasize in a moment that Psalms 1 and 2 form sort of an introduction to the whole book. Psalm 3 is really the first psalm that begins the organizational structure of the book. And look at how it opens. Here is a book called Praises. And after a few introductory Psalms, it begins with, O Lord, how many are my foes? And then look at Psalm 4. Psalm 4 begins with, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Look at Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Psalm 6, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Now it's not even any more about foes surrounding me. It's about God's anger against my own sin. Look at Psalm 7. O Lord, uh, O Lord my God, in you I take refuge. Save me from my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion, they tear my soul apart, rending it to pieces with none to deliver. This doesn't sound a whole lot like praises. In fact, not only does the subject of praise not really come into focus until the end of the book, the presence of the wicked appears over and over and over again. Once again, many contemporary Christians tend to skip over the sections in the Psalms that talk about the wicked. We get to all of the stuff about the Edomites and the Amorites and the parasites and the foes and the enemies. And and we just sort of glide through that looking for stuff about shepherds and praise and, and comfortable psalms. We don't like this emphasis on the wicked. We don't like the darkness. Well, what's going on here? It is exactly this organizational structure, this deliberate organizational structure that makes this book so beneficial for God's people. Because the book is arranged to portray the goal of praising God in the midst of enemies around us and even our own sin within us. 
The book of Psalms helps us to understand how that is even possible, and it actually forms this within us through the arrangement of the Psalms and the poetic expressions throughout them. Once again, this understanding reveals, I think, a deficiency in contemporary approaches to using the Psalms. If contemporary worshipers use the Psalms in personal or contemporary congregational worship, they typically do so as a means to express what is already in their hearts. But we don't go to the prophets to do that, do we? We don't go to the prophets to confirm or give expression to our theology. We don't go to the law to confirm our behavior. No, rather, we look to those portions of the authoritative word of God, to the prophets and to the law, to form our theology and to form our behavior. And the same should be with the Psalms. We should not go to the Psalms merely to give expression to what is already in our hearts. We ought to go to the Psalms to form us. Paul said in Romans chapter 15, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy, the law, Isaiah, the prophets, and the Psalms. You see, the important corrective, I believe, that will remedy modern deficiency among contemporary psalm usage is to understand this very central point. The psalms have been given to us by God not merely to find a mood that fits our present state of being, but rather God has given us the psalms to form us. And so this morning in this message, I'd like to focus our attention on the framework for how this works as it is laid out in the two introductory psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, which together serve as an introduction to the organization of the book and communicate God's purpose for the use of psalms in our lives and in our worship today. The very first word of Psalm 1 captures well the purpose of the book for our lives. Blessed is the man, the psalmist writes. To be blessed literally means a state of well-being, to to flourish, to prosper. To be blessed is what we might call the good life. This is what all people desire. We want to flourish, we want to prosper, and, and this is what God desires for us. Be fruitful and multiply was his blessing to humankind, not apart from him, but because him and through him. God wants us to be blessed under his superintendence. In fact, the psalm paints a picturesque image of this sort of blessedness in verse 3. The blessed man is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. And and clearly this introductory psalm is going to help us understand how to attain this sort of blessedness. The psalm begins, blessed is the man who... The the, the psalm is going to tell us the way to blessedness, the way to a state of well-being. And in fact, Psalm 1 is introducing the fact that the entire Psalter is designed to unfold the way to blessedness. Interestingly, this instruction for how to be blessed begins with three negatives. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of scoffers. There's an emphasis on three negatives for what we ought to do if we want to be blessed people. In other words, if you choose to walk down the, the, the way of the, the righteous person, the way of the blessed person, you're going to very quickly encounter opposition. You're going to find other people who counsel you to go another way who have different ideas of the right, the right way towards blessedness, right? In these very first introductory verses, Psalm 1 is setting up this contrast that we see throughout the Psalter, a contrast between two different approaches to the good life, 
two different ideas, two different conceptions of what it means to be blessed. You see, the the difference between a righteous person and a wicked person is not that a, a righteous person wants to prosper and a wicked person doesn't want to prosper. That's not the difference. All people want to prosper. The fundamental difference between the two, as Psalm 1 explains, is our conception of what blessedness will look like, and in particular, what forms that conception within us. Verse 1 here describes this like a path, like a way, something that we walk along that shapes our journey. Notice he says here, walks not, don't follow that path. Or the verse pictures it as a sort of counsel, influence that shapes your conceptions. These are all poetic pictures of influences upon a person's life that shape our imagination of what it means to be prosperous, of what it means to be blessed. And verse 1 says that the life of a righteous person is not going to be shaped by the way wicked people conceive of prosperity. This this verse is not just talking about overtly sinful influences, like don't listen to people who say that murder is okay. That goes without saying. But the the fact that, that this is counsel of the wicked, that the fact here is that this doesn't always appear on its face to be wicked. Wicked counsel doesn't always seem wicked. The way of sinners, especially if their way is prospering, doesn't always appear to be sinful. Sometimes it actually looks like prosperity. Sometimes it looks like blessedness. Sometimes the way of the sinner looks like power and wealth and influence and fame and fortune. Wickedness, even in the Psalms, is not always presented as a sort of notorious evil like murder and adultery. The Psalms use language of wickedness to describe anyone who does not submit to God or live like he is in control, even if it looks like they are prospering. The very nature of wickedness, the very nature of wicked counsel, is that the wicked imagine blessedness and prosperity as a life apart from any acknowledgement of God. Their very image of what it means to be prosperous is prosperity apart from God. In other words, the contrast here in Psalm 1 and throughout the Psalter is not necessarily between you, a righteous person seeking a blessed life in the Lord on the one hand, and a violent rioter burning down buildings, beating people up, and looting. No, the contrast is between you and your next-door neighbor, who's a good citizen, raises his children to be kind and helpful, and is living a pretty good life apart from God. That's the contrast. Which counsel is more tempting to you? The counsel of the rioters who say, hey, come burn down buildings with us. Or the counsel of a neighbor who says, you know, wouldn't it be nice to just sleep in on Sunday morning and have a relaxing day out on the lake? Who who needs God? I'm successful. I'm prosperous. I'm living the good life without God. Come join me. Which is the more tempting counsel? But the Psalms are here to tell us that a righteous person will not walk in that sort of counsel. And a righteous person will not allow his life, his path, to be shaped and formed by that way, by that image of a good life, that that image of a prosperous life apart from submission to God and obedience to God. Rather, as we find in verse 2, His delight, what will shape and form his path, is the law, the Torah of the Lord. Now, this word Torah, of course, specifically refers to the first five books of the Old Testament. But but isn't it interesting that just like there are five books of the Mosaic Torah, there are five books of the Davidic Torah, the book of Psalms. 
The editors of the Psalms, I believe, organized the collection into five books, at least in part to display a parallel with the five books of Moses. Everybody recognizes the importance and the life-regulating significance of the books of Moses, but do we recognize the same significance for the book of Psalms? Or to put it another way, we all recognize the critical importance of God's commandments, God's law, God's doctrine to govern our lives. But songs? Certainly they're not as significant. That's just extra. Music is just something enjoyable that we may or may not add on to what is truly important. But on the contrary, the editors of the Psalms, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, arranged these songs into five books in parallel with the five books of Moses as a way to say these five books of songs are the Torah of God with just as much important life-regulating significance as the five books of Moses. And a righteous person will delight himself in this. In fact, the Torah of Moses is absolutely important to give a righteous person the instructions that he needs to live a prosperous life under the rule of God. But the Torah of David is equally important because it shapes and forms the righteous, blessed life in a way that the Torah of Moses does not. Both are equally important. You see, our way, our lives are driven ultimately by whatever we allow to shape our image, our conception of what it means to be blessed, of what it means to be prosperous. There's the image of the wicked, an image of prosperity and flourishing apart from submission to God, and there is the image of the Torah, an image of prosperity that results from submission to God. And whichever image you have set before you will shape your way. This life-governing map, this inner image of what it really means to prosper is what the Bible calls the heart. This is why verse 2 says that a righteous person will delight himself in the Torah of the Lord. The heart in Scripture is not just emotion, not just feelings like we often define it today. The heart is an all-encompassing inner image of the good life, what it means to be blessed, what it means to prosper. And that inner image then drives everything about how we live and move and have our being. It It becomes the map that directs our way. As one author, David Noggle, suggests, As the image and likeness of God, people are animated subjectively from the core and throughout their being by the primary faculty of thought and affection and will, which the Bible calls the heart. In both the Old and New Testaments, the idea of the heart refers to, he says, the the, the central defining element of the human person. It is what drives our lives. And so whatever shapes that inner inner image, whatever shapes your heart is of utmost importance. If, If your heart is shaped by the counsel of the wicked, by the way of sinners, by the seat of the scoffers, if your inner image is shaped by their conception of the good life, then you will walk the way of the wicked. As James Sire argues, it is the heart orientation that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. The inner image of the world formed within us, our moral imagination, interprets the reality of God's world and thus affects how we evaluate and respond to what we encounter. It affects everything about how we live. It's what motivates and moves us to act in certain ways within various circumstances of life. This is why the Bible commands, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. 
Evangelicals today love to talk about Christian worldview, how we view the world, what drives us to live according to the scripture. But I often think that the common evangelical discussion of worldview tends to focus primarily or even exclusively on what we think. Now, thinking, of course, is centrally important. But to focus exclusively on what we think misses what Psalm 1 is setting up as the fundamental purpose of the Psalms. They don't just primarily inform our minds. They don't don't just primarily form our wills like the prophet and the law. Rather, the Psalms form the fundamental inner inclinations of our hearts. And this is important because our conception, again, of the good life, our conception of blessedness, our inner image, our inner hearts is what drives us. It's what helps us to make sense of God's world, how we perceive God's world, our interpretation of God's world depends upon how we imagine the good life, how we conceive of true blessedness. This is why the Bible uses tools of the imagination to communicate truth. The Bible contains literary forms, aesthetic devices that don't just decorate the truth. They don't just make truth more interesting. They actually rightly shape our imagination of the truth. They shape our heart response toward that truth, which is essentially important. This is why the truly blessed person, according to Psalm 1, will shape his imagination by the Torah. Our imagination of the good life, our conception of what it means to be blessed, will be shaped by God's image of the good life. And notice that the psalmist doesn't just describe blessedness in strict propositional doctrinal terms. Rather, he uses an image He uses poetry to shape our imagination of what blessedness truly is like. True blessedness is like a tree planted by an abundant source of nourishment so that it easily produces beautiful, rich, juicy, delicious fruit and never withers for lack of sustenance. The psalmist is describing blessedness here in a way that shapes our imaginations, shapes our hearts along with our intellects. This is what is meant by the term meditates in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The Hebrew word here literally means to vocalize. It has the idea of murmuring about something. Sometimes the word is translated to muse on something. Well, what do we do when we muse on something? Well, we allow it to roll around in our minds. We contemplate it from every angle. But but even that way of describing it is insufficient because it's more than just something that we do with our minds. It starts there, but it's more than that. It's something that we do with our hearts. To meditate on something, to muse on something, is to allow it to form and shape our hearts, our map of the world, our inner image of the good life. This is why this Hebrew word is sometimes in some translations translated as to imagine. What this this means is that meditation is more than just studying scripture. It's no less than that, but it's more than it. It's more than just thinking about doctrine. Meditation is writing the word of God on the tablet of your heart. It is, as we read a few moments ago in Colossians chapter 3, to meditate on the word is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And what's particularly instructive about that instance in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, is what comes next. 
how do we allow the word of Christ to dwell richly within us? How do we meditate on God's word? How do we muse on the Torah? By singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, this kind of image-forming meditation on the Torah is a function of our hearts, of our imaginations, and this requires not only doctrinal statements, not only the Mosaic Torah, it requires forms of the imagination. It requires songs, the Davidic Torah. You see, we muse on the Torah when the Torah takes on the form of music. And this is exactly what the book of Psalms is for us. As the five books of Moses are the Torah for the mind, so the five books of Psalms are the Torah for the heart. God intends for this collection of Psalms to form and shape our image of what it truly means to be blessed, our image of what it means to flourish as we meditate on these songs, as we muse on the music of God-inspired songs. And again, this is the difference between a righteous and a wicked person. What forms your image of blessedness? A wicked person's image of blessedness is prosperity apart from God, but a righteous person will have an image of prosperity under the rule of God, formed by musing on the Torah of God. And so really the fundamental purpose of the book of Psalms is to help to form a proper image of blessedness within us. It is the Torah, God's word, shaping our image of true blessedness under God's rule such that we will truly prosper and flourish even in the midst of wickedness around us and sin within us. The blessed person, the truly blessed person will meditate on God's word. He will muse on the music of the Torah such that he is formed by it. But already we begin to see a significant deficiency in modern Christian approaches, really even to Christian life in general, that result from an anemic underappreciation for the Psalms and what these God-inspired songs are supposed to do. A a sort of overly intellectualized Christianity, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not minimizing doctrine and the intellect, but an over-intellectualized Christianity fails to recognize the purpose and power of the Psalms in forming the Christian imagination of the good life. Instead, we tend to view music as just sort of exciting packaging for the far more important doctrinal content. But what these introductory Psalms are beginning to reveal to us is that God has given us this collection of psalms as a critically important means for directing our paths in a way that the law and the prophets by themselves don't. We need all of it. Psalm 2 continues this theme. Psalm 1 began by saying that a truly blessed person won't allow his image of the good life to be shaped by a wicked image of the good life, Psalm 2 shows us what that wicked image is. It shows us the counsel of the wicked. It shows us their imagination of prosperity and blessedness. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? There's a deliberate development here between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Notably, the Hebrew word for plot here in verse 1 is the same term as the word meditates in Psalm 1 verse 2. This idea of musing on something, something that forms and shapes your imagination. The, The King James translates this phrase, the people imagine a vain thing. Interestingly, the New Legacy Standard Bible rightly translates both as meditates. The righteous person meditates on God's law day and night. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on a vain thing? This is a picture of the wicked imagination of the good life. A righteous 
person's imagination will reflect the law of God, a wicked person's imagination will reflect a different vain thing. And what's, what is that image? Well, notice what they say about the rule of God in verses 2 and 3. A righteous person imagines the rule of God as that which enables blessedness. How does a wicked person imagine life under the rule of God? Verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. This is what the wicked imagine God to be like. Again, their problem really isn't about their theology, what what they intellectually think in their minds. It's not that they deny the power and rule of God. They acknowledge it. They acknowledge that God is ruling, but they imagine that rule entirely different than a righteous person does. Wicked people muse on different music. When they consider the rule of God, they conceive his rule like bonds to be broken, like cords to be cast away in order for there to be true freedom. The wicked image of the good life is a life of prosperity apart from God with explicit rejection of his rule because they imagine that rule to be oppressive. And so these two psalms are expressing two different images of life under God's rule. A, a, a life of uh, that, that imagines God's rule as a flourishing tree or an imagination of God's rule as oppressive bondage. And whichever image controls you will determine your ultimate destiny. If you think about it, this is how the wicked have imagined the rule of God throughout history. Think about the serpent's counsel to Eve. Did God really command you not to eat of that tree? That's burdensome. He knows that you're going to become like him. Burst that bond apart and eat of the fruit. Or think about the Tower of Babel. God had commanded Noah and his sons to be fruitful and multiply and increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. That was meant for their blessing, but their descendants migrated to the east and they said, that's burdensome. Cast that cord from us. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a top in the heavens and let us make for ourselves a name lest we'd be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. What God meant to be a blessing for them, they imagined as restraining. Or think about the Israelites. God gave them the law of Moses and God said, if you faithfully obey this, I will bless you. If you disobey this, I will curse you. And the people said, that's burdensome. If we want peace in the land, we need to intermarry with the Canaanites, contrary to God's law. If we want our crops to grow, we need to worship Baal, the god of the storm. If we want to have children, we need to worship Ashtaroth, the god of fertility. Let us burst those bonds apart. Let us cast those cords from us. They wanted the good life, but their wrong image of life under the rule of God, their imagining a vain thing, led them to cast off what they saw as restrictive bonds and cords when actually the law that God had given to them was the path toward true flourishing. I could go on and on. This is the story of human history, is it not? In none of these examples did the wicked necessarily have a deficient knowledge of the fact that God is the creator and ruler of all things. Their deficiency, what, what formed their path is what they imagined the rule of God to be like. And this is exactly the point of Psalm 2. These introductory psalms are presenting the structural framework for the entire Psalter that is meant to shape our imagination as the people of God in order that we might rightly interpret the reality of this world under the rule of God, which will lead us to blessedness and praise even even as we are surrounded by wicked people with an entirely different image. In fact, this is how Jesus' apostles explicitly interpreted Psalm 2. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John experienced the first persecution by the Jews, and after they were released from prison, they quoted Psalm 2, 
recognizing this paradigmatic psalm as a fundamental lens through which to interpret all of human history as a conflict in images of the good life, a life under the rule of God versus a life that throws off the rule of God. And in fact, they recognized that their little part in the unfolding framework of Psalm 2 was nowhere near the most significant example of it. This kind of conflict happened in the garden. It happened at Babel. It happened with the children of Israel. It was happening to the apostles. But the most significant time that it happened is what the apostles immediately recognized. The apostles knew that the ultimate example of Psalm 2 was the crucifixion of the Messiah. And it was no stretch for them to interpret Psalm 2 in this way because this is exactly what Psalm 2 says. Verse 2 says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel again uh, together against the Lord and against his Messiah. The apostles correctly identified, of course, this Messiah as Jesus. In other words, Psalm 2 explains how the fundamental truths of Psalm 1 play out in world history, and the Messiah is the center of it all. The apostles knew because they had mused on God's music, the Psalms had formed their imagination, and so they knew, they interpreted their experiences through the light of this music. They interpreted the conflict that they were experiencing in light of this, and that kept them on the right path toward true blessedness. But not only is the Messiah the ultimate quintessential example of this story of conflict between the wicked and the righteous, two different images of blessedness, but the Messiah is the solution to the whole thing. We see this in how Psalm 2 portrays God and his response to the imagination of the wicked. Again, this is, this is setting up a set of images that are developed in the entirety of the Psalter and that form a God-inspired imagination of reality. Consider the image Psalm 2-4 paints here. It says, he who sits in the heavens. That word sits paints the picture of one who rules, one who is enthroned in the heavens. He who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. This is a picture of God as king. The Psalms use many different images of God to shape our conception of him, but the overwhelmingly dominant image is of God as king. He is called king. You'll find references to his throne like we have here in chapter 2, verse 4. You'll find other images like scepter and kingdom and dominion and reign and rule. Even the title of judge connoted in the ancient Near East the idea of a ruler. Even the idea of shepherd In Psalm 23 is the idea of a powerful ruler and king of Israel. When we think of a shepherd today, like in Psalm 23, we typically think of cuddly little sheep and sitting by a stream in a pastoral setting. But in the ancient Near East, the image of a shepherd was a royal image. Psalm 80, verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. To call God the shepherd of Israel is to imagine him as king. And so it is of no accident that Psalm 23 comes right before Psalm 24. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. You see, from beginning to end of the Psalter, these songs lead us to muse on God as king. These concrete images form our imaginations. What one author calls the eyes of our heart, an image of the good life under the rule of God. And so how does this king respond to the rage of the nations? How does he respond to the vain imagination of a good life apart from his rule? He laughs. But this laughter is not at all humorous. It very quickly turns to derision, verse 4. He will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, verse 5. You break the bonds of my rule, I will break you. 
verse 9, with a rod of iron and dash you in pieces like a potter's vessel. You set yourself against my anointed one. You reject him and arrest him and accuse him falsely and strip him and beat him and mock his rule with a crown of thorns. You nail my anointed one to a shameful cross. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, verse 6. This certainty of destruction for those who live according to a vain imagination of a good life is also something that is communicated throughout the Psalter. And it's communicated particularly in the progression of the Psalter's organization. If you trace the appearance of the wicked throughout the Psalms, especially pictures of wicked flourishing, you'll notice that there is an intensification of contrast between the wicked and the righteous in the first 40 Psalms, book one, that begins to thin out throughout the rest of the Psalter. And when you get to the last 50 Psalms, where there's a focus on praise, there's hardly any mention of them at all. There is a movement in the book from conflict to blessing, from lament to praise. And when you get to the last psalm, Psalm 150, there is absolutely no mention of the wicked. They're gone. Which is exactly what Psalm 1 predicts. The wicked will be like chaff that the wind drives away. They're here in force For 40 psalms, they continue through most of the psalms, but then they begin to dwindle, and by Psalm 150, they are gone. So here we have two conflicting images, two images of the good life that are competing throughout world history, an image of a tree that flourishes under the rule of God and an image of God's rule as oppressive and tyrannical. The wicked's counsel is that the only way to flourish is to burst the bonds of God's rule and cast off his cords. But what does the righteous counsel? Verses 10 through 12 of Psalm 2 tell us. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the counsel of the Torah. This is an accurate image of what it will be like if you resist the rule of God as king. The last line of Psalm 1 promised, the way of the wicked will perish. And so the Torah counsels, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Intentional parallel there. Acknowledge him as king, accept that image, or you will not stand in the judgment. But if your image of the rule of God is a thing to be broken and cast off because you imagine him as one who is terrifying, then that's the image that's actually going to come to pass. You resist his rule as something oppressive, and you will experience oppression. You break his bonds, he will break you. Your image of the blessed life and its relationship to the rule of God will determine how you live, and it will determine your ultimate destiny. But if you kiss the Son, the Torah says, if you serve him with fear because you know that his law is not burdensome, you don't imagine God as a tyrannical despot. You imagine him as a shepherd king, as your redeemer. If that's your image, then you will be blessed. Blessed is the man, Psalm tells us, Psalm 1 tells us, whose imagination is shaped by delighting in the Torah rather than wicked counsel. And the final phrase of Psalm 2 is put there intentionally by the Psalter editors to form a bookend with Psalm 1-1. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. If you imagine God correctly as formed within you by his inspired songs, then you will fly to him for refuge. You will see him as the source of true blessedness and as the one who will provide safety and comfort and protection in the midst of a wicked world. 
And so let us return then to our initial concern about the utter lack of psalm usage in the modern evangelical world. Perhaps one central reason for the neglect is found in the reality that most modern Christians fail to recognize the fundamental importance of the imagination in directing our paths. Having been so impacted by a post-enlightenment scientific modernism, modern Christians conceive as the core of Christianity, Christianity to be exclusively intellectual. We give no attention to our hearts, no attention to our imaginations. Art then becomes an enjoyable diversion at best and a distraction at worst. Modern evangelicals stress the importance of sound doctrine, but liturgy, poetry, and music are treated merely as a means to excite us about doctrine or make doctrine more interesting. It is no surprise that modern evangelicals use only the exciting psalms if they use them at all. No lament for us. But if this discussion of the Psalms has revealed anything, it is that artistic elements of worship are not incidental. They fundamentally orient our paths by forming our imagination of true blessedness. And it is not an imagination that ignores the reality of wickedness without or sin within. This is particularly evident in the progression of the Psalter's organization and why we must not simply pick and choose the praise psalms that give expression to what is already in our hearts or worse, are used to escape the reality of a sin-cursed world. A lot of Christians have the wrong image when they read Psalm 1 in isolation. They think if they just choose the righteous path, then everything will be carefree without any trouble or adversity. And so their worship music is happy, clappy, escapist, feel-good ditties that form snowflakes rather than warriors. But the whole Psalter is here to show us what the blessed tree actually looks like and what the nature of that growing will actually be. The book is structured this way so that we will know how to be blessed in the midst of that reality. God doesn't want us to escape from reality or ignore reality. He wants to bless us through that reality. The prosperity that is promised for those who choose righteousness is not an easy prosperity. It is not prosperity apart from wickedness and adversity and hardship. It is prosperity through hardship in the midst of adversity, in side-by-side contrast with wickedness. It is a tree planted by a river, but a tree attacked by insects and choked by vines and infected by disease. And in spite of all of that, it is still flourishing. And so this is why we need songs of lament. We need the penitential psalms. We need the psalms of trust and the wisdom psalms and the litanies and the psalms of praise. We need all of them to form within us a true and proper and realistic imagination of what a truly blessed life in this world, happily submitting to the gracious rule of God, will be like. Without the psalms, The entirety of the Psalms, churches are forming men without chests, brains filled with knowledge, but unable to navigate the realities of life in a sin-cursed world. But when we truly recognize what the book of Psalms, God's music, does for those who muse on these songs, the absolute necessity of singing singing them all becomes apparent. Hope is formed in our hearts in the midst of wickedness around us and sin within us by musing on the Torah of David. By traveling along this path that the psalm editors created for us from darkness through adversity to blessedness. We sing our way through the psalms from songs of lament to songs of praise. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you that in your great wisdom, you gave us your sufficient word. And in your word, you have given us the law and the prophets and the Psalms. Help us this morning to recognize the essential nature of these songs. Help us to commit as individuals, as families, and as churches to muse on the inspired music that you have given us. 
And we praise you that when we do that, that brings you ultimate glory, but it is also for our best good. It is what will truly lead to our lives of blessedness, happily submitting to your rule, because we imagine your rule rightly. And so I pray that you would renew within us a desire to sing the songs, psalms, to read the psalms, to study the psalms, to preach the psalms, and to muse on the psalms. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.